Hi, Tim Bale here, co-director of the Mylan Institute at Queen Mary University of London. Welcome to another in our series of videos on the COVID-19 crisis, global health security and pandemics. In this episode, entitled The Politics of Loneliness in Pandemic Britain, uh, we hear from Professor Barbara Taylor, who is Professor of Humanities in the School of History and English and Drama at Queen Mary University of London. Barbara Taylor discusses the loneliness crisis that has engulfed Britain during the pandemic and highlights how individuals have turned to each other in acts of kindness to fulfil the social obligations that aren't necessarily being met by the government. I hope you enjoy the video. If you do, please do share it with your friends and please do sign up to the Myelin Institute to hear more about our work. Hello, I'm Barbara Taylor, Professor of Humanities at Queen Mary and principal investigator on the Pathologies of Solitude uh, Research Project funded uh, by the Wellcome Trust. And um, in this video, I'm going to talk briefly about the politics of loneliness in pandemic Britain. Uh, in recent years, we've heard much um, from UK politicians about an epidemic of loneliness, more deadly, we're told, than any other health threat. We even have a government minister for loneliness. Now, in the midst of a global pandemic, we've been hearing far less about this. But a politics of loneliness is still with us, although in ways our government is much less eager to acknowledge. Loneliness has always had a political dimension. The first person to theorize this was Hannah Arendt, who in her 1951, The Origins of Totalitarianism, drew an influential distinction between solitude and loneliness. Solitude, Arendt said, was a positive experience of being, in her words, alone together with oneself. A self-companionship rooted in the inner dialogues of thought. Totalitarianism, Arendt argued, destroyed this two-in-one of solitude, replacing it with loneliness as people's capacity for free thinking was overwhelmed by ruthless totalitarian logic. A simultaneous loss, she said, of self and the world, resulting in an absolute loneliness, destructive of all human living together. Well, we don't live in totalitarian times, or at least not yet, but the loneliness that Arendt describes has resonance for us. Solitude can indeed be a positive state. Many people in lockdown have described it like this, although many others have experienced it as a debilitating isolation. But today, as in Arendt's day, we are all suffering from a politically fostered loneliness, Although to understand this, we need to turn from her to another 1950s theorist of solitude, the psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott. In 1958, Winnicott described the capacity to tolerate solitude, or even to enjoy it, as a developmental achievement of early childhood, acquired through the experience of receiving care from a parental figure usually the mother. As a small child matures, this caring figure is internalized to serve as an inner presence, a self-companion when the child is alone. The state of being alone, Winnicott wrote, paradoxically always implies that someone else is there. For a person who has had no reliable care, Solitude is unendurable. A person may be in solitary confinement, Winnicott wrote, and not be able to be alone. How greatly he must suffer is beyond the imagination. In recent months, many people, I believe, have been suffering in just this way. Some have never received the care that makes aloneness tolerable while many others have found the caregiving presence crumbling under the pressures of enforced isolation. People with chronic illness or disabilities, prisoners, homeless people, those with psychological disorders, older people in care home. Here we've had a real loneliness crisis. 
an existential threat, as one expert describes it, that may be lessening for, now, for some as lockdown eases, but at the cost of ongoing infection risks. Mental health providers have been hearing much about this. Suicide rates have been climbing. But there's another kind of loneliness I want to suggest that afflicts everyone in this country. As we look to our government to get us through this crisis and find no care at all. As with Trump in the US, the carelessness of Boris Johnson, Dominic Cummings and their cronies is an existential threat to every Briton. Tens of thousands have not survived this threat and many more will die from it or emerge damaged in a host of ways. I'm sure I don't need to remind anyone listening to this video about the manifold shameful ineptitudes of this government that have resulted in what is so far the second highest COVID per capita death rate in the world. This reckless disregard has been and remains terrifying. And the terror goes deep, exposing our vulnerability, not just to disease, but to the heartlessness of the powerful. Such callous carelessness isn't new, although rarely has it been so flagrant. Long years of neoliberal austerity have paved the way, asset stripping the NHS and care services, hollowing out the public sector. The pre-COVID loneliness epidemic was mostly a proxy for this assault on care. Rates of self-reported loneliness among older people have changed little over the last 60 years. There has been an increase in life changes that can trigger bouts of loneliness, but even here the figures are far below those publicized by media and government. So why the headlines about loneliness as the plague of our times? The answer lies with the demolition of services and institutions that have the public good as a core value from youth clubs and day centers to public libraries and above all, so-called social care. The hypocrisies of governments that talk about loneliness while systematically destroying key sources of social connectedness is breathtaking. So in this current health crisis, what do we do left to the mercies of an uncaring government? Across Britain, people have turned to each other in a huge upwelling of mutual aid and volunteer action. Kindness to strangers is everywhere. This has been wonderful to witness, but it's not enough. Democratic regimes have an obligation to care for the people they claim to represent. Our collective loneliness will only be relieved when this care is forthcoming and those who have not provided it are held to account. Not later, but now, before we are engulfed by a second wave of sickness and death in this unfolding tragedy of careless governance.